Breaking overnight, nearly 100,000 bitcoins have been stolen from exchange platform Bitfinex. This is the largest seizure of cryptocurrency ever. In 2016, the cryptocurrency exchange Bitfinex announced a major security breach, one that would rattle the crypto market like never before. $65 million worth of Bitcoin had been stolen, and no one expected it to be this couple a tech entrepreneur named Dutch with ties to Mark Cuban, and his wife, a woman named Heather Morgan, who liked to rap. Getting run by golf cart, poison you with the frog, dark shit on you like a fart. If you can call it that. As these two thieves sat on their stolen loot, letting their friends, family, employees, and social media followers believe everything was normal, Behind the scenes, federal investigators would say their lives looked like something ripped out of the pages of a spy novel, complete with burner phones, hollowed out books to hide valuables, fake passports, and items bought on the dark web. And while this couple pushed their cat in a stroller around New York and pretended to be successful entrepreneurs, federal agents were closing in as they planned their secret escape. All the while, the amount of Bitcoin they stole would grow to be worth over $5 billion. This is the bizarre story of the Bitcoin Bonnie and Clyde and how they almost got away. Before we begin, a quick note from the sponsor of this video, June's Journey. June's Journey is a hidden object mystery mobile game set in the 1920s with beautiful vintage scenes and a riveting story. This game is super relaxing, and I really like that it's mellow and I can play it anywhere. One thing you might not know about me is that when I'm not creating videos on scams and cults, I'm watching true crime. I can't get enough true crime, and June's Journey is perfect for me because it's a mystery game with a detective storyline that lets you look for hidden pictures, which are the clues that help you solve certain crimes. I found the game relaxing, yet lightly challenging. It also helps improve your sense of observation while having fun. One thing I loved is that I got to decorate an estate in the game, so it was fun to make my own little space cute and exactly how I wanted. This game is completely free to download and already has over 10 million downloads with a 4.5 star rating. So make sure to check out June's Journey by clicking the link below in the description box. Now, back to the video. Heather Morgan was born in Oregon and grew up in Tehama, California, where her father worked as a biologist and her mother a high school librarian. They were a typical middle-class family, two parents doing their best to make ends meet and raise their daughter to become the best version of herself possible. On her YouTube channel, Heather described herself as an only child and creative who lived in her own universe. As a teenager, Heather would sometimes pick walnuts or clean houses for money. After graduating high school, Heather was accepted into UC Davis, where she graduated in 2011 with a bachelor's in economics and international relations. Heather wanted to see the world. First, she traveled to Hong Kong, where she worked at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, teaching students about American culture. In 2012, she arrived in Cairo for a postgraduate degree in international economics. It's unclear exactly what happened, but less than a year after arriving in Cairo, Heather would leave in early 2013 after telling a friend she wasn't making any money. I need money, she told him. After returning to San Francisco, Heather decided to rebrand herself. She lied and wrote on her LinkedIn that she had earned a master's degree from the American University in Cairo. It was only found out this was a lie after a spokesperson for the university recently told Forbes that Heather left the American University in Cairo after only one semester and never earned a master's degree. Heather went on to add to her LinkedIn profile that she had worked for the World Bank in Cairo as a developmental economist. But Heather wasn't an economist, and it hasn't been confirmed that Heather even worked for the World Bank during her short time in Cairo. Heather then began calling herself a tech entrepreneur, 
And in 2014, when she was 23 years old, she founded a company called Salesfolk, an email marketing firm with the slogan, Be a Goat, Not a Sheep. Her company website, which is still up to date and littered with grammatical errors, claims, quote, We are the first company to specialize in cold email copywriting and have pioneered many of today's popular outbound email best practices. Have you ever been told you should send eight emails in order to get a response? That came from our research findings. Heather did well with sales folk and was determined to make a name for herself. She envisioned herself as a thought leader and startup genius. I'm Heather Morgan and I'm the CEO and founder of Sales Folk. Um, there aren't really a lot of resources all in one place for salespeople. And I think a lot of salespeople, they don't really, I mean, there's not really, as far as I know, like sales as a major in school. So you don't really have that training before you come into it. And so it's really important to actually get that training and some companies will give it to you, whether it's internal or hiring a trainer, consultant, whatever, but not all of them do, especially startups. And so I think it's really important um, for salespeople to have those resources. Heather was living comfortably, making what appeared to be a nice income through tech and marketing. From 2017 to 2021, Heather contributed as a writer to Forbes and Inc. magazine, writing 47 Forbes articles and over 100 articles for Inc.com. In her Inc. articles, she wrote about business emails and email signatures with one tip that read, sending emails with errors make you look dumb. And in another Inc. article, she recommended readers sign off their emails with sent from my iPhone or Android just to give their business emails a more personal feel. In a Forbes article titled Why Women Often Beat Men at Negotiation, Heather wrote, Using my negotiation skills, I've closed six-figure deals over nothing but email and a five-minute phone call, knocked 20 grand off my rent, and saved tens of thousands in health insurance. I built a multi-million dollar business in my early 20s without any investor funding, and forged many lucrative business partnerships with major brands, all without introductions or attending an Ivy League school. According to herself, Heather was a major backbone in several tech businesses that shaped the world to become what we know today. But who someone is and how they want others to perceive them can be two very different things. In an industry where people move fast and break things, Heather may have found herself a bit out of her league, as former friends and co-workers would describe her as someone who made herself and her businesses sound more successful than they were. Heather was also an avid TikToker, where she shared tips for getting started in tech and making money. In this TikTok, she defensively tells people to stop copying her email template in which she signed off with cheers because most people who stole her template probably aren't British. Here's one of her TikToks about her email templates. So many people have stolen this email template from me, the quick question subject line, and notice they sign it with cheers. Guess what? That's because I lived in Hong Kong and I used to speak British English. Probably this guy did not, and probably most people who are doing that did not. Rather, they are blindly copying my cold email templates that I made five to seven years ago. This is a perfect example. The reason why you should not do that is because messages change all the time. The market changes, audience changes, and when you copy something, guess what? Probably thousands, if not a million other people have as well. I see this template, quick question or like quick idea, whatever it was, uh, something idea in my inbox all the time, but it's not effective anymore because it was already done to death. Okay. But there were two sides to Heather. Besides being a well-traveled and educated entrepreneur who used the word hustler in her email signature, Heather loved taxidermy. She also loved to rap a lot. Silver on my fingers and boots on my feet. Always be a goat, not a goddamn sheep. Email me, fuck your message at the beep. Beep, 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 beep. I'm many things, a rapper, an economist. 
artist, a journalist, a writer, a CEO, and a dirty, 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 dirty. Her rap alter ego was named Razzlecon, and she dubbed herself the Crocodile of Wall Street. On her YouTube channels, she made videos about how Razzle Khan's favorite color was purple and signed off in the description box telling people to remember that their best self is always their real self. Dazzle, dazzle, don't forget, your best self is always your real self and uh, being yourself is what's really cool. That's what's up. <sighs> As Razzle Khan, she didn't just rap about sex, drugs, and money, although there was a lot of that. Many of her lyrics were about social injustices, women's rights, and sexism in the tech scene. She blasted the streets of Manhattan with Razzle Khan merch, proudly showing it off on her social media. On her Razzle Khan website, she wrote about sticking up for misfits and underdogs everywhere. She was an oddball and owned it. In one of her songs titled Please Go Fund Yourself, Razzle Khan rapped, quote, So much bankruptcy from this healthcare cost, American dreams totally f***ing lost. Paying for healthcare bills with GoFundMes, either that or you got a cam in your undies. American healthcare system wants you to die. Trying to pick insurance will make you want to cry. So why even bother? Why f***ing try? Not a single decent option to even buy. Her two online presences couldn't have been more different. While one second she was writing articles about the tech scene, the next she was rapping about stealing money to get rich. Ironically, in 2020, when Heather was 29 years old, she wrote a Forbes article about how to protect yourself from cyber criminals. In her bio at the bottom of that article, she called herself an expert in persuasion and wrote about a new company she co-founded called EndPass, which used AI to automate identity verification while detecting fraud and combating cybercrime. And if there's one thing Heather knew well, it was cybercrime. Because at the same time she was writing these articles about protecting the vulnerable, Heather Morgan was sitting on 119,754 stolen bitcoins, or at the time, $64.7 million, and she had been sitting on that loot for years. And that stolen money would grow to be worth $5 billion, making her one of two of the richest thieves that ever lived. But every Bonnie needs her Clyde, and this is the part where the second richest thief enters the story. Heather's husband. But first, we have to talk about Heather's first husband. You see, when Heather left Cairo and returned to San Francisco without a master's degree, she dabbled in the tech scene, writing in an online post that she was forsaking her identity as an expat in emerging markets to sink her teeth into a new kind of challenge, tech startups. She networked in the tech scene, attempting to get in with various startup companies, and this is how she met Bruno de Souza, a Brazilian man who co-founded an app that allowed users to track their pets. In the summer of 2013, Heather and Bruno met in New York, but had only known each other for a short time when an intense romance began, and they were married within a few days. Bruno claimed to Forbes that the marriage was intended to secure Heather with a visa so she could stay in Brazil and work on his pet tracking startup. But just as quickly as the relationship started, it ended, and Heather moved back to the States in October of that same year. Heather told a friend that she had been forced to flee Brazil due to her husband cheating and because the relationship had become abusive. Bruno de Souza denies these claims and claims he believed Heather to be depressed and that she made up a story to explain why she was leaving Brazil, stating, quote, I think she wanted to tell some story that she was a survivor, end quote. At the end of that same year, before the divorce papers had been filed, Heather's friend Haley, who she met at the American University of Cairo, flew to San Francisco to pay Heather a visit. While at dinner, Heather introduced her to her new boyfriend, saying, quote, This is Ilya. He's a black hat hacker. End quote. And this is where the mastermind of the heist enters the story. Ilya Lichtenstein, who went by the name Dutch, was born in Rostov, Russia, and raised just outside Chicago in Glenview, Illinois. 
He loved history and video games, and while in high school had been captain of the math and quiz bowl. He graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison with a psychology degree. But Dutch had stars in his eyes for Silicon Valley, and so he left everything behind to move to California in 2010. Not long after, he wrote in an old blog, quote, I have a simple rule for dealing with incoming email. If you send me an email and I don't know you, I need to know in about 15 seconds how reading this email is going to make me money. If, after 15 seconds of reading, I don't know that, I move on to the next email. End quote. Dutch launched several online ventures. One was a dating site. Another was a site that sold brain supplements. He also worked on a hacking tool to evade CAPTCHA security measures. But he would find success in a data-driven marketing startup he co-founded called MixRank in 2011. It was doing so well that MixRank received funding from well-known shark and billionaire Mark Cuban. Heather had moved into Dutch's San Francisco high-rise apartment not long after they began dating. He was a proud, self-proclaimed nerd who loved her weirdness and encouraged her taxidermy and Razzle Khan's rap career. The couple knew they wanted children, but not at that moment, as they had much bigger plans in store. While battling endometriosis, Heather decided to have her eggs frozen. The couple shared a cat named Clarissa, who they took on long walks while pushing in a stroller, with Dutch even tasting her cat food just to make sure it was palatable enough for her. I taste all her cat food. I tasted her tiki cat, and I'm like, this is pretty good. It needs salt, it needs pepper, but other than that, like, it's pretty good. And that's why I bought a bunch, because I'm like, this is like palatable to me. It'll be palatable to her. And I was correct for a time, and then she lost interest in it, and now she'll only eat food from New Zealand. <laughs> so then you just keep filming me expecting something to happen. What do you want me to do? You want me to just, like, shove something up my ass and do a little dance and run around and wiggle it for you? It'll kind of pop out. Is that what you're waiting for? Not today. In the heat of the moment, the couple would use Clarissa to distract federal agents, but more on that later. In 2014, Heather hired her friend from Cairo. Haley was hired as a remote worker and the first employee for sales folk and paid $1,300 per month. In a later interview, Haley would recall that Heather had created two fake employee profiles on LinkedIn to make the company seem larger than it really was. All in all, things seemed to be going exceedingly well for Heather and Dutch. They were in love and living the dream working in the tech scene. But was it enough? It was around 2015 when the couple's behavior noticeably began to change to friends and family. Only one year after being hired, Haley received a call one morning from Heather, who told her that she was being terminated because business was slow. And in May of 2016, Dutch suddenly left his company, MixRank. None of his employees knew why, with one stating, quote, We were all trying to figure out why did he walk away now? We were doing really well. Our revenue was jumping pretty quickly, end quote. The couple was over internet marketing. Why? Because they had masterminded an elaborate heist that would make them rich beyond their wildest dreams. And on August 2nd of 2016, people around the world would be impacted by Ilya Dutch Lichtenstein and Heather Morgan. On the morning of August 2nd, 2016, Bitcoin investors woke up to news of a shocking digital heist. Breaking overnight, nearly 100,000 Bitcoins have been stolen from exchange platform Bitfinex. I logged into my account and noticed that my entire account had been drained. I was crying and sweating. Let's give a brief rundown of what cryptocurrency is. Cryptocurrencies are digital tokens that are stored in digital wallets. They are a type of digital currency that allows people to make payments directly to each other through an online system. Cryptocurrencies have no legislated or intrinsic value. They are simply worth whatever people are willing to pay for them in the market. Unlike cash or fiat currencies, which are owned by the central bank, cryptocurrencies are decentralized, meaning the network the cryptocurrencies trade on belongs to no one. Many people like this because they don't want the government being able to prevent them from accessing their money if they deem it necessary to do so, nor do they want the government tracking their money. 
This is a basic explanation, but let's move on. Many regulators say the problem with cryptocurrencies is that since this network belongs to nobody, tracking transactions is difficult and criminals tend to find it easier to hide their illicitly gained money. Although there are many different cryptocurrencies today, the one that started it all was Bitcoin. And it was in August of 2016 when the Bitfinex Currency Exchange announced a breach of security. 2,000 single approved transactions were sent to just one wallet. Upon news of the stolen crypto, Bitcoin's trading price dropped by more than 20%. Bitfinex responded by halting all Bitcoin withdrawals and trading on the platform, attempting to track the hackers. But Dutch and Heather had anonymous accounts, so no tracking was going to be had. Even Bitfinex accounts that had not been hacked dropped by more than 30% in response to the change in price. Even though Bitfinex was known as a secure trading platform that used multiple securities to keep customers safe, there was little the platform could do to stop the effects of the hack from damaging their customers and their reputation. At the time of this recording, this is what we know about how the couple scam went down. In 2016, the couple set up untraceable accounts in various countries. Just like a spider web of transactions, they planned on transferring the funds from account to account until they could safely get a hold of it. Only one final account would ever be connected to their own names, and that was the one that would be used to finally gain access to their precious cryptocurrency, or other people's money. The heist had been planned for months in advance, and weeks before it was executed, Dutch was already inside Bitfinex with the power to move funds without the company even knowing. He was watching, learning, but never doing anything that would draw attention to what was to come. Dutch planned that they would initiate a series of transactions to move the funds and transfer them into accounts all held by Heather. They would make use of the dark web to launder the money without any traceable evidence. After moving the money around enough, Dutch hoped that Bitfinex and any government investigators would eventually lose sight of it. But if that plan worked, it wouldn't be enough, because even if they could get the coins out and far away from Bitfinex, they would need to eventually get the money into their own hands. For this reason alone, Dutch had planned to create fictitious identities online that would be used to pull the funds out and turn them into real cash. He would use computer programs to automate the transactions so they could take place as fast as possible. Then they would transfer the funds to an account in Ukraine where it couldn't be found or touched by the United States government. All they would need to do then is get to the account and the Bitcoin Bonnie and Clyde would be free to spend their stolen fortunes and live freely for the rest of their lives. They dreamed of moving overseas and finding a new home, one where the money would be theirs without question. But that plan didn't happen right away. While many victims of the hack worked with investigators and Bitfinex in attempt to recoup their losses, as well as struggling with depression from having their hard-earned money stolen, Dutch and Heather sat on that laundered money for years. In 2017, the couple left the West Coast and headed east, moving to Manhattan and renting a high-rise Wall Street apartment, where a studio apartment in that same complex rents for $5,000 a month according to real estate listings. This was when Dutch began planning something else behind the scenes, a proposal. He would brag on social media that he spent months mapping out what he thought would be the perfect way to ask Heather to marry him. The day finally arrived, and Dutch took Heather out on the town where she would see her face plastered all over NYC. Literally. Dutch had paid to have countless posters of Razzlecon put up all over Manhattan, with the final location being a Razzlecon billboard in Times Square. According to advertisers, on a regular day, the cost of a digital billboard in Times Square can range anywhere from $5,000 to $50,000, depending on the complexity and location of the ad campaign. The image Dutch chose was taken from one of Heather's music videos, and Dutch wrote on the billboard, the most brutally honest rap album of the year. Brutal indeed. Heather said yes, and the couple were officially engaged. After the 2016 Bitfinex heist, life for Dutch and Heather changed. They were living it up in their New York high-rise, taking lavish trips around the world, 
and funding Heather's music videos. Now that Heather wasn't running sales folk anymore, she seemed to spend most of her time showing herself off to the world as RazzleCon. She shared nonstop on TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and YouTube. She rapped in bathrooms, elevators, in public, and on Wall Street. She didn't only rap. She liked to also show her girl boss lifestyle to the masses. Dutch and Heather had managed to launder a total of 119,754 bitcoins valued at $66 million at the time. Dutch once told Heather about her rap music, quote, I love you, I support you, but I don't want to be involved, end quote. At a later date, Heather would use a recording of Dutch saying this in her song, Moon and Stars. I love you, I support you, but I don't want to be involved. And possibly because Dutch wasn't paying much attention to Heather's lyrics, he might have not known that Heather's rap hobby was doing the couple no favors, as she was leaving a trail of breadcrumbs for investigators. In a 2017 presentation for Sales Folk, Heather stated that her company generated $64.7 million in revenue in 2016. But other salesfolk employees, including Haley, told the media that there was no way salesfolk could have brought in that much money, specifically because salesfolk only had a total of five employees with a range of salaries between ten dollars to $30,000 before Heather let everyone go due to the company not bringing in enough funds with one former employee even telling Forbes that the company couldn't afford to pay them when they got terminated in 2016. But what investigators would later notice that was in that 2017 presentation, Heather quoted nearly the same amount she and Dutch stole in bitcoins the year before when talking about her company's profits. Heather also put out a music video titled Menace to Society. This video would later be mentioned by prosecutors for a very specific reason. But first, I'm going to attempt to show you a short clip of the music video with audio, if she doesn't copyright claim me first, which she has been doing to others online. Menace to society, higher than the sky can see. You can't get as high as me, synesthesia I can see. Menace to society, higher than the sky can see. You can't get as high as me, synesthesia I can see. Big trouble maker, made rules cause I'm me. Crazy outlier, notoriety. In this video, prosecutors would cite Heather's lyrics where she described herself as the catfishing queen. In court documents, they also cited other lyrics where Heather said, quote, spearfish your password, all your funds transferred, end quote. Behind the scenes, when Heather wasn't rapping about fraud or lying about her company's profits, the couple were going to great lengths to hide their crimes. In 2019, they flew to Ukraine on two separate occasions with Heather leaving more clues on social media for investigators where she documented her trips to Kyiv. While in Ukraine's capital, they would stop at a nearby hotel to the one they were staying in. There at the front desk, they would ask for packages that had been sent to them and walk out. Using the dark web, they had ordered these packages from Russia. Some of these packages included SIM cards, bank account details, and fake identities and passports for Dutch and Heather to use once they left the U.S. for good. Around the same time, Heather was invited to be one of the speakers at a small entrepreneur conference. She spoke about using social engineering and persuasion to get ahead in the business world. I hate the term manipulating, but it's, it's getting someone to share information or take an action that they otherwise would not. I like to think of social engineers as underdogs. Uh, a lot of times, if you don't have an advantage, you have to create one for yourself, and how do you do that? I'd like to do that through social engineering. Heather then told the audience about a time she and a friend broke into a historic Hindu temple in Cairo. She went on to boast about how she offered the temple security guard 10 Egyptian pounds and cigarettes and got the guard to give them a tour instead of arresting them. Heather went on to tell the audience how to crash events so you can network your way to the top. But somebody in the audience wasn't buying this and asked Heather if she ever felt guilty for using such shady techniques. And as Dutch looked on from the side of the room, this was Heather's response. 
like, my end goals aren't like bad or evil. Like I'm not trying to scam someone out of money or like, like get someone hurt in any way. And although she said she wasn't scamming anyone, it was only a few weeks after this presentation that Heather and Dutch flew to Ukraine to retrieve those secret documents. While the couple didn't go out and buy Ferraris, a mansion, or anything that might make people think they had a financial windfall, they were spending some of the stolen loot. Dutch had bought 70 gold coins worth tens of thousands of dollars. Heather purchased Walmart gift cards that were then converted to air miles. They also bought gift cards to Uber, Hotels.com, and PlayStation. Dutch also created fake investment companies with fake employees. And while staying in five-star hotels like the Ritz and Mandarin Oriental, the couple traveled all over the world to Vietnam, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Egypt, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. When friends and family asked, they told them that they were now crypto investors. Through all of this, the price of Bitcoin was rising. By 2021, only two years after they had visited Ukraine, the initial millions they laundered was now worth $4.5 billion. And while the billion-dollar couple planned their wedding, federal investigators were tracking them, getting ready to make their move. Because the couple had stolen so much Bitcoin, they needed to spread it out through thousands of transactions and into more wallets in order to not raise any alarms. But in 2017, a software security company noticed something suspicious. Someone was laundering stolen crypto through Alphabay. Alphabay was one of the world's largest vendors that sold illegal substances on the dark net. Someone had opened a store on Alphabay, and as they watched, that same store began to process hundreds of fake transactions, making them look like sales before quickly closing the store. The proceeds from that store were then funneled into secret crypto wallets. This is an intelligent money laundering technique called chain hopping and peel chains, where crypto is sliced and diced and then put back together in order to make it less identifiable. A few months after someone had created this store on Alphabay, the founder of Alphabay was arrested and feds were able to seize Alphabay's servers. Once accessed, investigators were able to piece together clues that led them from the Bitfinex hack straight to 75 Wall Street. Now the feds had to determine who in this elite area could pull off such a sophisticated crime. In one of Heather's songs, she rapped, I'm a mother beast living on the coast that's east. Crocodile waiting for a feast. Razzle dazzle living in a glass castle. And one night in the summer of 2021, federal agents would arrive to Razzle Khan's glass castle when they pulled up to the couple's glass apartment building in downtown Manhattan at 3 a.m. They arrived in unmarked, government-issued vans and silently entered the building through its revolving doors. With weapons drawn, they flashed their badges and told the doorman someone in that building was distributing CP. We need to go up to the roof to see if we can track where the signal is coming from, they said. The shocked doorman showed them the elevators. He was convinced the agents had the wrong building, and a little while later, the feds rode the elevator back down to the lobby and left. A few weeks later, the agents returned and did the same thing. Then again, a little while after that. Finally, the doorman asked, Are you sure you're in the right building? An agent looked at the doorman and told him it was definitely that building, and then headed for the roof. It was early fall the next time they came back, and this time their strategy had changed. They told the doorman their signal was getting stronger, and now they were only interested in one specific floor. A little while later, under the cover of darkness, they got back into their unmarked vehicles and left. It was now November of 2021, and the wedding day had arrived. Heather and Dutch boarded a plane to California, where they got married at Playa Studios in Culver City. The couple told their friends and family to not take any pictures or recordings of their wedding. While Heather's friends waved gold spray-painted banana leaves, 
Heather was carried into the ceremony on a Moroccan palanquin and dressed in gold from head to toe. Heather and Dutch cried during their vows, where they talked about how they had been so lucky to meet in San Francisco and fall in love, and how they had moved to New York City to start a family together. He called her his best friend and the woman of his dreams. Guests were given Razzlecon stickers as favors, and a magician performed at their lavish reception. Dutch even got up in front of everyone and performed some magic tricks himself. And of course, Heather performed a rap song. To end the night, the couple surprised their closest friends with an announcement that a secret bus would take them to an exclusive after-party at a mansion in Westlake Village, where they had hired a DJ, bartenders, and caterers who served hors d'oeuvres. With the massive venue and incredible food, even their closest friends were curious about how they were able to afford such an extravagant night. And what they were able to afford versus what they actually did with that money doesn't make a lot of sense. Heather and Dutch planned to eventually leave the United States for good and set off to Ukraine, a country with no extradition treaty with the U.S. government. But for some unknown reason, and what may be the couple's biggest regret of their lives, they didn't leave when they had the chance. It was now 2022, and the evening of January 4th was like any other night for Heather and Dutch. They played around with Clarissa, ate dinner, and went to bed with no idea of what was to come. At 7 a.m. on January 5th, agents from the FBI, IRS Criminal Investigation Division, and the Department of Homeland Security entered 75 Wall Street through the rear entrance. They took the freight elevator up and rushed down the long hallway to Heather and Dutch's apartment. They banged loudly on the door, announcing themselves and barged in. The couple had been asleep. Clarissa immediately ran under the bed, and the agents offered them the opportunity to, to stay and watch as they went through their things or leave. The couple decided to leave, but first asked if they could grab their cat. It was then that Heather climbed under the bed, acting as if she was going to grab Clarissa, but instead grabbed her cell phone from the nightstand and tried to lock it. An agent saw this and tackled Heather to the ground, the phone had to be wrestled out of her hand. There in the couple's lavish New York apartment, behind the taxidermied animals and exotic trinkets collected from around the world, federal agents would find something straight out of a spy novel. There were books with hollowed out insides and $40,000 in cash tied together by pink rubber bands. There was also plenty of foreign money and a burner phone inside a Ziploc bag aptly titled Burner Phone. The team of agents collected more than 50 tablets and around 200 electronics from the apartment. There was no shortage of evidence tying them to something suspicious. And one month later, Heather Morgan and Ilya Dutch Lichtenstein were arrested and charged with conspiracy to commit money laundering and conspiracy to defraud the United States. According to the U.S. government, Heather and Dutch attempted the largest financial seizure in all of history. Even though the government was able to retrieve 94,000 Bitcoin worth about $3.6 billion at the time, 25,000 of the original coins were still missing. Those coins had already been transferred out of Dutch's wallet via a complicated money laundering process that ended with some of the stolen funds being deposited into financial accounts controlled by Heather and Dutch. When the news broke and Razzlecon became known, Social media had plenty to say. Yet, in between the month from when the feds raided their home to before they were arrested and charged, Heather continued to post on social media as if nothing had happened, while Dutch laid low. She posted a rap song about endometriosis and continued to post about crypto, investing, and pictures of Clarissa. At the time of this recording, Dutch is in a Virginia jail and Heather is still living in their old apartment on house arrest. A judge considered Dutch a flight risk and denied him bail due to his ties with Russia. While no plea bargains were made while I wrote this, surprisingly, Heather left the defense team that was representing her in Dutch and retained her own defense attorney, meaning she no longer shares an attorney with her husband. Both are working with the United States government in hoping of working out a plea deal to avoid the possible 25 years behind bars for their charges. 
It's unknown yet if one will turn on the other in hopes of getting a lighter sentence. What's interesting, however, is that neither of them are officially documented as hackers of the 2016 heist. Rather, they were allegedly only able to launder a small portion of the more than 100,000 stolen bitcoins, and instead claim that the true hacker dumped some of the stolen coins into a wallet they had control over. Although all evidence points in their direction, the United States has yet to claim that either of them is the official perpetrator of the hack, and they have never been charged with the hack itself. On January 17th of 2023, Heather asked the court to loosen her house arrest restrictions so she could be allowed to work three days a week. She was recently hired for the role of growth marketing as a business development specialist by what some speculate to be a tech firm, although her attorney asked the judge to keep the name of her new employer private due to the social media harassment she's received. The judge granted his request and allowed Heather to work from her new employer's office on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. Currently, Dutch and Heather are awaiting further court proceedings to see what the rest of their lives have in store for them. When promoting one of her songs titled Gilfalicious and talking about growing older on TikTok, Heather once stated, quote, If my lovely husband dies, I will have plenty of f boys, and it's going to be pretty epic. End quote. It's unclear if Dutch was merely a stepping stone for Heather, a way for her to live a better life because she realized she couldn't fake her way to the top of the tech scene, or something else. Whatever it was, this case proves that some will go to any lengths in order to get what they want most. In the case of Heather and Dutch, money was their most powerful drug. They stole millions that turned into billions, and they were willing to go to the most extreme lengths to pull off the largest crypto heist in U.S. history. This has been the story of the Bitcoin Bonnie and Clyde. If you are a fan of learning about scams, cults, and cautionary tales, subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you'll be notified when a new documentary comes out. My name is Josie, and thank you so much for watching. Remember to check out June's Journey mobile mystery game by clicking the link in the description box below. Thank you to June's Journey for sponsoring this video.